Hi, and welcome to Digital Defense. My name is Jordan Robertson. I'm a cybersecurity reporter uh, in, in, with Bloomberg News in Washington, D.C. This is our weekly cybersecurity webcast, and uh, as always, this is an interactive show, so we uh, encourage you to write in with any of your questions, either about this week's topic uh, or any topic uh, on your mind about uh, cybersecurity. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about uh, online banking. Uh, you know, specifically, you know, with all the news of, uh, of hacks going around, you know, how safe is it really to, uh, to access your money online? Uh, I have a couple of pretty simple answers, but also, uh, also some tips and tricks, uh, you know, to make that, uh, make accessing your money uh, online, uh, you know, even easier. Um, and again, we're broadcasting uh, live here on Facebook uh, and Periscope. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to write them in the comments uh, section below. Uh, you know, or you can tweet to us uh, at technology, that's the Bloomberg Technology uh, Twitter account, and uh, we'd love to hear from you there. So I, I want to get into this topic uh, by way of, uh, of anecdote. Uh, you know, a couple years back, uh, a cybersecurity firm named Kaspersky, uh, you know, came out with a really interesting report about a, uh, you know, a, a very advanced group of cyber criminals and, you know, the, the possibility that they had stolen a billion dollars, a billion U.S. dollars, uh, you know, from banks around the world. Now that figure was subsequently disputed. The cybersecurity community, some in the in the community, you know, questioned whether that was an accurate number. But for the purposes of this discussion, let's leave that to the side. I mean, you know, at the very least, what Kaspersky disclosed and discovered was a highly advanced, uh, you know, bank hacking operation. You know, that really shows the future of, you know, what are the threats that banks face, and uh, you know, and by extension, you know, what are the threats that you, as a consumer and a user of banks. Uh, you know, what kind of threats do you face and what kind of threats do your money face? So I want to walk you through what that example was uh, to give you a sense of, you know, what really the state of the art looks like these days in terms of, uh, you know, what banks need to be worried about. And again, by extension, what you need to be worried about. Uh, so the group that Kaspersky had identified was called Carbonac. Uh, this was a worldwide hacker group. But the reason I'm bringing them up is, you know, what they did was so interesting because the way we tend to think about uh, bank uh, cyber attacks is that they attack individuals' accounts. So somebody's going to attack my account, drain the money, uh, get somebody to cash it out somewhere, uh, and then you're left, uh, you know, you're left with a drained account. Uh, that's typically the way you know uh, bank hacking has been uh, understood. Uh, what this group's, uh, you know, one of their primary innovations was, you know, they found many different ways to drain money from banks, uh, and that's why, according to uh, to Kaspersky. Uh, you know, they were able to uh, amass, uh, you know, as, as much as potentially a billion dollars uh, from these thefts. Uh, and the way they did it is this. Again, you know, the way we typically, this is a graphic that Kaspersky produced. They have a very good, uh, you know, marketing division and PR division that produces these things and it, it's pretty helpful. What you're seeing here, the, the most important thing here is, is what's on the right side. Um, there are four different ways that this group drained money from, from victim banks and only one of them was uh, you know targeting individual account holders. What they were really after was the bank's money, not individuals' money. That's a lot of work to uh, compromise individual accounts. Uh, they wanted the bank's money. So what they did, uh, you know, was um, the first one is the most basic: online banking, taking money from somebody's account and transferring it to uh, accounts held by the criminals. Uh, but the other three are the most interesting, and, and what I really think is relevant uh, for viewers of the show in terms of understanding how the you know state of the art hackers think about. Uh, attacking banks these days. And again, any questions you have, feel free to leave them in the comments section or tweet to us uh, at technology. We'll uh, happy to answer questions about this or other topics as we, as we go along. So here are the three other ways that attackers, uh, in this case, uh, you know, drained money from banks. One of them was e-payment systems. So they compromised kind of the bill pay systems of these banks and they, they transfer money, the bank's money, from one place to the other. Because, you know, banks, of course, have um, you know, have uh, have constituents and clients as well, not just uh, individual consumers, but you know, banks banks pay other banks lots of money all the time. So the attackers compromise that that those systems uh, to transfer money to accounts they control. Uh, this one I think is really interesting. They would, um, you know, by attacking the the underlying databases, the the bank's underlying accounting systems. Uh, one of the things they were able to do is falsely inflate people's accounts. So if you've got uh, one dollar in your account, they would say you've got ten thousand dollars in your account. They would skim off the difference and transfer that to an account that they control. So the individual account holders never know that something's happened, uh, unless you were, uh, you know, I guess unfortunate enough to uh, to be logged into your account when somebody's adding adding money to it, which most people would and find uh, a big problem with. Uh, however, again, what the attackers would do is they would they would tinker with 
the bank's actual accounting systems uh, add money, uh, you know, to people's accounts uh, and trick the banks into believing that these were legitimate transfers to accounts under the, bank, the hackers' control. It's a very clever system uh, and one that uh, the individual consumer would never catch, but it's the bank's responsibility to catch. Uh, and then, you know, the thing that got the most headlines, uh, which is kind of the most visual, is the attackers figured out how to compromise certain ATM machines. Now, these were not by creating um, skimmer devices and creating fake uh, debit cards, which is the, you know, the, the common way that attackers have uh, hacked ATM machines. What they would do again is these attackers were, are very high level. They were after the underlying databases that controlled these systems, including ATMs. So one of the things that they would do is they would trick the ATMs into thinking that, uh, that, it was, uh, that, that what needed to happen was a withdrawal. So they would basically tell the ATMs, you know, in cybersecurity, the, the rule of thumb tends to be that if you, can, if you can trick a system into introducing an error, any error basically, if you can control where that error is and how that error occurs, you can command computers to do all kinds of things uh, that they shouldn't normally do. And in this case, what they commanded the computers to do was to spit out cash, literally spit out money, uh, you know, at the, uh, at the whim of the, uh, of the attackers. So you know, with all of these, with all of these uh, different types of attacks, you know that gives you kind of a sense of this is again this is the state of the art in terms of how attackers uh, you know think about hacking banks. It's not just I want access to your account. It's I want all of these different things to happen. And I'll, I'll show you a map here as well. I mean, this this particular group. And again, this report is you know a year and a half old, uh, but I think is really uh, illustrative of the threat. You know, these are where all the banks were that this that this group targeted. We're getting some good questions, so I will uh, I'll get to these. And again, you can leave your questions in the comments section or tweet to us at technology. Um, question here is when I'm traveling and I log into my online banking app on someone someone's Wi-Fi, is that safe? Well, you're going to hear me say this a lot. Uh, and any, anybody who's viewed the shows before uh, you know, knows the answer to this. Uh, there are a couple of different answers to this. You know, one, if you have what's called two-factor authentication on your bank account, which you should, uh, you know, that means you'll get a text message you know, anytime somebody tries to log into your account. Just as a, a general principle, that's a really good safeguard uh, to making sure that uh, somebody doesn't log into your account as you if they steal your password. Uh, you know, that being said, that's just a good kind of internet hygiene uh, principle to follow. But the question here is specifically referring to someone else's Wi-Fi. You know, the thinking has evolved and practices have evolved around this issue of using public Wi-Fi. Uh, public Wi-Fi is still dangerous. You know, public Wi-Fi is a public space on the internet, uh, and uh, you know that means if you connect to the, if you connect your computer or your phone to a public Wi-Fi network, there is a possibility of hacking. Uh, you know, but I, I like to tend not to think in terms of, you know, is an advanced attacker going to be sitting there waiting for you to log on? Uh, you know, in most cases, most banking apps these days do have good encryption, uh, you know, on those connections. So what you're really concerned about is if somebody's sitting on that Wi-Fi hotspot, uh, you know, can they see me typing my password, you know, into the banking, uh, the banking website or the banking app in this case? You know, chances are your bank app, as long as it's kind of a, you know, a modern bank that you're with, uh, is going to have encryption. Uh, so you don't need to worry about somebody stealing your password that way in most cases. Uh, you know, and also, if you have two-factor authentication, even if someone does steal your password, if they try to log on to the, the website, you'll get an alert and you'll be able to deny, uh, deny them that ability. So don't necessarily assume that public Wi-Fi, uh, you need to stay away from it, which is what we kind of you know, cautioned people to do uh, years ago. Uh, the thinking has evolved as encryption has evolved as well. Uh, next question here is, is it safe to close your banking app without logging out? Or should we be logging out every time? Well, as luck would have it, uh, you know, most most banks and, and most sophisticated, uh, you know, technology uh, operations, banking operations, they'll log you out automatically. Uh, you know, and that's for this very reason. It, it's not so much because they're concerned that somebody will pick up your phone or log onto your computer and log into that app. Uh, they're more concerned about something called cookie hijacking. And what that means is, actually, to the the the, the previous viewers. Uh, question, if somebody can steal the cookie that authenticates you to your banking app or your banking website, say from a public Wi-Fi uh, hotspot, um, you know, in theory they could go back after you've, you've left the machine and log in as you. Uh, it's a kind of complicated attack, but one that we saw actually used against Yahoo uh, when they lost a billion user records. One of the ways those attackers worked was they were able to manufacture their own cookies to kind of pre-authenticate themselves into people's accounts. So most banks are going to log you out, you know, kind of on uh, on on your own. 
Uh, so it's not something you should generally worry about. But you know, good security, good internet security hygiene is to log yourself out just in case somebody finds your phone or in case somebody has stolen that authentication credential that gets you into that account. Uh, it's just a good practice, but it's not, it doesn't necessarily need to be top of your list because of those precautions that are put in there. Uh, next question is, what about Venmo? Is that safe? Uh, you know, I haven't looked specifically at that app, but I know it's a, it's a popular one. I know a lot of people use it. But I would say this in general. In general, uh, you know, part of the issue with some of these peer-to-peer -peer, uh, systems is that you have to link them to your bank account in most cases. Um, on its own, that's not terrible. I mean, PayPal, you know, many people have their bank accounts linked to their PayPal. PayPal's been around a long time. Uh, they have what the industry has generally regarded as very good security. So the only thing I would caution you about in regards to these new apps is, you know, linking something to your bank account is always potentially a risky thing because, you know, the app security, the third party app security, you know, may not be and probably isn't as secure as the actual bank itself's app. Banks spend you know, more money than almost any other industry on cybersecurity. And they're not perfect, but they get hacked a lot and, uh, or they get attacked a lot. And, uh, and they're used to deflecting some of those attacks. So whether it's Venmo or others, again, I haven't looked specifically at the security of Venmo. I would just be wary, a little bit leery of linking those to your bank accounts directly if there are ways to add money to those, those accounts and those services without linking it to your bank account. Uh, I, I think in general, that's usually the safer bet, uh, the safer way to go until the apps get pretty mature. Um, next question here is a lot of apps ask for your credit card info now ahead of time like Uber, is that safe? Well, again, this is another area, and, and one of the, the, the benefits, I think, of this, this show uh, in highlighting is that it used to be if somebody stole your credit card, you were in for months of, 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 of hurt and, and discomfort because it would just take you, you know, countless hours to call retailers and call your bank and call anywhere that somebody, you know, misused that credit card. Now, you know, credit cards are one of the least impactful things that a, a hacker could steal from you. So again, there's been this, this switch, and I think a, a big reason for that is because, uh, you know, banks and retailers and others have gotten really good at detecting fraud. And, and, and even more than that, uh, you know, they've gotten really good about reimbursing people very quickly when they've been the victims of fraud. Uh, so, you know, in terms of giving a credit card to an app like Uber, again, I would say, like, it doesn't need to be you know, the highest thing on your list in terms of something you need to be concerned about. Uh, because we've all been contacted by banks, uh, you know, saying, hey, your credit card number's been compromised by some retailer or some gas station you used it at, you know, 10 years ago or whatever. Uh, we're sending you a new card. I mean, it can happen within a day. So I really wouldn't worry about that too much. But you do need to pay attention to your credit card account. I mean, that's one of the responsibilities of, of having, you know, any of these, any of these devices uh, and any of those, uh, those tools like a credit card. As long as you stay on top of your account and you, you watch for suspicious activity, uh, you know, that's always going to be your best defense. Um, the next question is, what about depositing checks via mobile banking? I am actually a big fan of this technology uh, because it, 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 it saves you the risk, the physical, real world risk of actually going to a bank with a check and a, and a bank account and, and, and a card and logging into the account. So I think, you know, sparing yourself the risk of actually having to go to an ATM where many crimes do occur because people are, people are even if they don't go there with the intention of withdrawing money, you know, the ability of yourself to to put your card in the machine and then authenticate yourself via a pin or fingerprint or whatever it is, that's really valuable to the criminal. So there, there are lots of cases where people are assaulted at ATMs and I think, you know, uh, um, eliminating any of that risk, again, it's not a hacking risk, but it's a, it's a physical world risk, I think is actually a really great thing. Uh, but you do need to keep on top of the banks. You need to make sure that they've registered the, the amounts correctly. Uh, but the machine learning, the machine vision, computer vision technology that does that, is really simple and it's really good. It's not like it's to trying to detect faces. It's just detecting numbers on a, on, a, on, a, on a piece of paper. So that's actually not the hardest technology problem in the world. So generally they're pretty good. So yes, I'm an advocate of depositing checks uh, via mobile banking where you take the picture. I think it's a good, I think it's a, it's a good practice. Uh, how secure is PayPal? Well, I yeah, addressed this a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, again, I don't have any special insight into whether PayPal is more or less secure than the banks that, um, uh, you know, that you connect uh, your accounts to. Uh, but what I do know is this, that PayPal's been around a long time. PayPal has close ties uh, to the U.S. government. It works very closely with law enforcement. 
uh, you know, and it's, it's just seen so many attacks over the years. So just by nature of being around as long as it has, you know, any company that's been around a decade or longer and any company that's been around a decade or longer and exists in the financial services sector, uh, you know, is going to get really good at figuring out what the hackers are after and how they get into their system. So it doesn't mean they're perfect. I mean, tomorrow we could see some major PayPal hack that, uh, you know, that nobody else saw coming. Uh, but I would say it just in general, organizations like that at that scale and that size, uh, they, have, they tend to have very good security uh, protocols built in. But again, I t and I say this all the time, you can't depend solely on the company to protect your, your data uh, you know, 100%. You've got to set up the two-factor authentication. Uh, you know, and I sound like a broken record on it, but it, 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 it's impossible to overstate you know, how important that is. Uh, because what that does is it, it is it makes it a lot harder for anyone to log in as you and transfer money from one place to the other. Um, because hackers can get into these systems, and uh, and uh, and it just it's really helpful for you to have some measure of control. And two-factor authentication does get you that. Uh, next question here: Is it safe to use eBay or Alibaba on your phone? Uh, you know, I don't really draw a distinction between some of these services. Again, you know, I, not, I'm not in the business of recommending a specific service, you know, one over the other. Uh, but what I will say is this: again, established, you know, long-standing companies like uh, like eBay, uh, you know, and Alibaba, um, you know, they just they just tend to be more mature at these things, and they have more budget. Uh, you know, one of the concerns, if you're talking about startups, a, a viewer earlier asked about Venmo and other apps. Uh, one of the concerns with a startup is just that the technology may be great, the technology may be really cool, uh, but startups are in the business of building a startup. They're not necessarily in the business of security. You know, some certainly do a better job than others uh, you know, at it, uh, but you have to think of what the business priorities are uh, for a startup. And in general, it's not security. In general, it is just building the company and getting customers. So when you talk about established companies, they do have budgets, they do have you know, lots of IT security professionals, uh, and most importantly, they have relationships with law enforcement uh, you know, to where they can get good insights and good intelligence about, uh, you know, uh, ongoing threats and ways to protect themselves and, by extension, their, um, their users. Um, and in terms of, you know, whether it's safer or not to use it on your phone versus your computer, uh, you know, the, the technology is there such that, to me, it, it's kind of a distinction without a difference these days. Uh, you know, mobile networks in some cases are actually more secure than your home router. Um, it, it's not something I would really worry about too much, though. Uh, especially if you're doing it over a cellular connection, which is like, it's just harder to hack. So um, let's see here. Is the next question here is when we allow any applications such as games to access browser cookies in an Android phone, and we have bank apps in the same phone, is there a security issue? What the what the viewer is asking, I think, is essentially, you know, when you, if you allow an application to access or to place cookies on your phone. Uh, for one service, you know, is that a potential hacking risk for another? And I hope I'm understanding the question correctly. Um, and I think there's some value in this question. You know, in general, the, the, my kind of layman's understanding of how this works is that, you know, the cookie, the authentication token, as it were, that any site sets, you know, is going to be unique to that site and that service. So, you know, in theory, a cookie uh, for one service, you know, is not going to get you in uh, to a, a different service. It's not going to transfer. Uh, from one service to another. Um, so let's say a cookie for, you know, Gmail is not going to log you into your Yahoo account. Uh, you know, and hackers are always finding ways around these things. But in, in general, I, you know, this does touch on a topic that I'm, I am very interested in, though, which is, you know, apps require you in many cases to give more permissions than you necessarily would be comfortable with. And most of us, we click through because you want to download the app, you want to just get to it. So you don't really have a choice. So it's kind of like a false choice that, you know, these apps are telling you, you know, do you allow the, this app to access this data? Like, if you've downloaded the app, you obviously want it. Uh, so I would love to see statistics on the number of people who actually say, no, I don't, uh, I don't approve of those, position, those, those permissions and I'm not going to install this app. My guess is that the vast majority of people just click all the way through. And the problem with that is not so much that a hacker can bounce from one app to another, which I, again I think is what the viewer is asking. The, the bigger question for security and for privacy is that many of these apps collect data that they don't even know they're collecting. So these startups, which again are focused on building a company and creating interesting technologies, in many of these cases, and we've seen this, we've talked to founders of startups who say, 
you know, I, I designed the, the technology to collect, collect X, Y, and Z data, but I wound up collecting all kinds of things like GPS location, like, you know, browser cookies, like search histories, like all of these other things that they didn't necessarily know that they were, they were collecting. So to me, that's almost a bigger issue because you just need to be aware if you've got a million apps on your phone, that's great. Hopefully you enjoy the technology. Uh, you know, but uh, many of these apps can collect data that even the, the owners of those companies are not aware of, which as crazy as it sounds, it, it does happen and it happens a lot. Um, and the result of that is if those companies get hacked, and again, these tend to be smaller companies or individuals, uh, that data such as location uh, and things like that, such as search history, it could leak that way. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, we're getting a lot of great questions. Thank you for, uh, for sending these in. Again, you can leave them in the comments section or tweet to us at technology. Uh, and we'll get to all these. A lot of people are commenting, uh, you know, that Bitcoin is a solution to all of this. What are your thoughts? So Bitcoin's a really interesting technology. I mean, you'll hear lots of people talk about Bitcoin being the future of banking, period. And, you know, one of the reasons for that is that there is what's considered a public ledger in Bitcoin. You can see, you know, there's a finite uh, amount of Bitcoin in the world right now. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin mining operations, as they're called, you know, it takes a lot of computing power and a lot of advanced, uh, you know, mathematics to create more Bitcoin. So there is not only, uh, you know, a finite supply of, the, of the, the digital currency, but also most importantly from a security perspective is this idea of a public ledger. And what that does is it allows any entities exchanging Bitcoin, you know, to assure some degree of um, authentication uh, about the transaction. Now there's a big asterisk here, is that, you know, uh, some viewers, many viewers may recall uh, the big WannaCry ransomware, uh, you know, of a week or so ago. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of security experts about it, and they say one of the reasons we're seeing these really big ransomware attacks, where hackers, you know, infect your computer, encrypt your data, and demand usually some kind of small payment of $100 or $200 or whatever to decrypt your data. The reason we're seeing many more of those is because of the rise of digital currencies, such as Bitcoin. So while there is, quote unquote, a public ledger, uh, if you're a criminal and you're registering accounts that are not in your name, they're not on computers that you actually uh, have associated your personal identity with, there are many, many advantages for criminals in the anonymity that digital currency can afford as well. So it really is a double-edged sword. I'm very interested in the technology because of this idea of the public ledger many banks are as well uh, you know because one of the hardest parts about financial services when it comes to preventing hacking attacks and things like that is you know authenticating that the people receive sending and receiving money you know are legitimate legitimate individuals and not criminals uh, Bitcoin has a potentially interesting way you know around that problem but again you know with any technology uh, especially security related technologies there are often it's often a double-edged sword and I say this to people all the time you know many def defensive cybersecurity technologies can also be used for offense because the best defense in cybersecurity is a good offense you've got to know where the holes in your network are same is true with digital currencies and things like that so there's uh, you know apologize that there's not a, a clean easy answer to that question uh, but I do think there's a lot of promise and uh, the technology was designed in such a way that you know all the major banks are very interested in it for that reason. Um, some really great questions here. Uh, so many people rely on online shopping now rather than going to a physical store. Do you have any safety tips for online shopping uh, on your phone? Uh, again, I'll sound like a broken record, two-factor authentication. Uh, you know, because online shopping is so easy and because some criminals have, you know, decided it's just far easier to traffic in, um, to fence illicitly, uh, illicitly purchased goods, uh, such as, you know, I break into your Amazon account and I order myself 10 flat screen TVs and then go sell them, uh, you know, uh, into, the, into the criminal underworld. Uh, you know, it really does benefit you to have the same protections that you would on your online uh, banking accounts. Uh, in your e-commerce accounts as well, because criminals are not just interested in money, uh, they are also, also interested in expensive electronics and other goods that they can sell. Um, next question here is, is it possible to completely erase my digital footprint when terminating accounts with apps like Venmo? Well, when you delete those services, if I think I'm understanding the question correctly, uh, you know, there's always going to be, these companies will always have your data, and, and companies, you know, have different policies regarding data retention. Especially though, here's the trick, when it comes to financial services and, and things like money transfers, I don't care what app you are, any company is going to be very, very afraid of getting a warrant from the federal government 
uh, you know, for information related to potential money laundering using your service. So by default, these services are going to keep lots and lots of records, unless they're designed for security or privacy. But again, that, that, that raises potential issues for them, because if the U.S. or some other government, you know, slaps them with a warrant for information, and they believe criminals or worse terrorists are using these services to transfer money, and again, this is not a commentary on, on Venmo or any other app specifically, uh, these, these organizations tend to keep very good records. In some cases, they keep good records because the government has demanded that they do so. Um, so just because you erase the app doesn't mean you've, you've eliminated uh, you know, any record of your transactions, but again, apps do you record data differently. Uh, but when, you, when it deals with, when it comes to financial services, there's just going to be lots and lots of record keeping because companies need to protect themselves. Uh, and that's just a reality of the, the world that they live in. Um, so wanted to thank everybody for, uh, for writing in. We've gotten some really interesting questions. Uh, this is a topic that I think is really valuable uh, broadly and one that we're going to be revisiting because, you know, we all have these apps, we all have these smartphones, and there are lots, a lot of questions about, you know, should I feel secure entering my social security number, you know, into this app or my bank account number and things like that. And, uh, you know, hopefully one of the value, uh, some of the value of this show is, is, uh, is letting you know when the thinking and when the conventional wisdom has changed on some of these practices, such as Wi-Fi and uh, credit card numbers and things like that. So we're always happy to take your questions offline as well. Uh, please feel free to, uh, again, tweet to us at technology. Uh, you know, my Twitter account is at JordanR1000, J-O-R-D-A-N, the letter R1000. And uh, please do feel free to uh, log on to our website, which is Bloomberg.com slash technology, where we've got a great podcast called Decrypted. Uh, you know, my colleague Mark Gurman has a great uh, webcast as well called Gadgets with Gurman. And, uh, and we're going to be back here next week at uh, noon Eastern. So thanks for watching and, uh, you know, look forward to doing it again next week.